talk in our uh, morning series here is uh, by Richard Foss. We will be talking on recontextualizing the solar system, space exploration, and human values. A little bit about uh, Mr. Foss. Uh, Richard Foss is an associate professor of humanities at the University of Arizona. He has a doctorate in comparative literature. His current interest is in uh, the ethical and social implications of uh, contemporary science, especially astronomy, astronomy and planetary science. Recontextualizing the solar system implies that we begin to think about it in a different way. And that's what I'm going to uh, propose and describe. Um, I'd like to give you two images in uh, A and B and how we might get from A to B. The first image is of our stewardship of planet Earth. And this follows upon uh, the last speaker. Today, we have taken ownership, we have taken responsibility for the dynamics, the processes of planet Earth. When something happens unpleasant in Brazil or Somalia, it is not difficult to convince the person in the street that we should do something about it. Now, we get in foreign entanglements, not every foreign venture is uh, profitable or wise or good in the end, but we clearly have accepted as a cultural assumption that we bear responsibility for what goes on. And so the ordinary person understands that the temperature of the Pacific Ocean off the coast of South America or burning the rainforest and things of that sort are vital to their personal interest, our interest as a nation, and our sense of community and survival as a planet. Now, it wasn't always like that, and it doesn't have to be that way. That is the way it is now, and I hope it continues. If we go back to the period before World War II, it was not too difficult to find people living in basically the Midwest, uh, Iowa, Illinois, who said, we don't have to worry about World War II. We'll just stay here. The worst case scenario, if the Germans take over Western Europe and the Atlantic, and they land in New York and start fighting their way inland, and if the Japanese take over Asia and the Pacific and land in California and start working their way inland, chances are they'll never get to Illinois. And so you had this sense of space that is radically different from the assumptions that we consider normal today. This was an unusual point of view, but it did exist. Image B is where we take this notion of caring, of planetary stewardship, and we apply it to the entire solar system. It is not that we are venturing out into the unknown when we go to Mars. We are going next door. There are physical distances. We all understand this. But it's an awfully long way from here to Australia. When you think about how far away it is, it's sometimes a miracle that we ever got here. And yet, Australia is part of a community that includes Europe and Asia and Africa. And Eventually, we will adopt a new common cultural assumption where the solar system is our home and the explorations that we do go out beyond the Oort cloud, beyond the Kuiper belt, into interstellar space, and that will be the risky venture. But what we'll be doing here at home in the solar system is managing in a responsible way the inevitable conflicts that will arise between national interest, business interest, human rights, depletion of natural resources, etc. And how can you deplete the natural resources of the solar system? When the first settlers went west, they thought that the world was infinite. There's all the water, there's all the food, there's all the buffalo and cows you could ever imagine. Now we see it quite different. We're fighting each other over every little bit of water in Arizona where I live. Your home is a common problem in the West, very difficult. And yet, we are the great-grandchildren of the pioneers who moved the West. And so we have to remember that as we go out into the solar system, it is not infinite. We will be managing it, I hope, carefully and responsibly. Let me show you some pictures. What I would like to do now is take you on an historical journey. And we will go way back. I would like to, in a sense, uh, excavate the philosophical underpinnings of the resistance to space exploration that we find uh, in the common community. This beautiful painting is by Donato Credi. It's part of a 
series called Astronomical Observations. It hangs in the Pinacoteca in the Vatican. Donato Preti did uh, a series of about eight of these for a cardinal of <coughs> And what I would, what I'd like to point out several things about this painting. It's, it's oil on canvas. Um, this is the sun up here. Here you see a beautiful Galilean telescope. And what they're doing, of course, is focusing through the image, uh, through the telescope, the image of the sun on a sheet of paper, and then analyzing it. Of course, you've all done this as children. You can see the sunspots, and you can count the rotational period, etc. Notice the beautiful sunset going on in the background. Of course, you have. Uh, a sunset in the background of the sun up there, not a problem in the art of this period. Notice this, the telescope is not exactly pointed at the sun, but it is pointed in the aesthetically uh, appropriate direction in terms of the dynamics of the painting itself. And again, you have the uh, beautiful effect uh, of the silhouette of the flowers against the sky, the, the leaves against the sky. Notice the, the beautiful lyrical uh, way that the, the drapery uh, is treated on these figures. This is basically it's, it's early 18th century, but it's a late Baroque Bolognese uh, kind of style, very sumptuous, very lyrical, very graceful. Um, what I want to point out about this is that you're all familiar with the great split between the sciences and the arts, the great split that occurs basically during the Romantic period where the scientists go one way and the artists and the poets go another. This painting is before that split. This painting is like those of Leonardo and Raphael. It is saturated with a sense of nature where nature is still alive. The gods, as it were, have not been driven out yet. There is a, a sense of myth uh, that nature is, is in some sense alive in this painting that we don't find in later periods. And so we know that we can live there again. Uh, the question is how to get there. Now, there's some other paintings in that series. Uh, again, notice the, the very lyrical and graceful quality of the figures. This is the painting of the moon. Uh, he does versions of all the planets. Uh, this is Jupiter. And you can see three of the Medicean stars, including uh, Europa, uh, Io, and, and probably Callisto. If you look carefully, you can see, again, these, these paintings are very, very dark, and so this is overexposed to bring out the details. Bands along Jupiter and the great red spot. Um, this is in a period of excitement, of course, over the wonderful new vistas being revealed by Galileo's telescope, and yet still filled with uh, a sense of nature uh, that uh, is not going to be there for long. Now, to go back just a little bit more uh, to Aristotle, I'd like to begin with a basic philosophical distinction that comes from the Greek world and which persists uh, in some quarters, almost up to our own time. And that is a philosophical distinction that Aristotle makes in the second chapter of Book One of De Kylo on the Heavens. He attempts a demonstration. Uh, you're all familiar with the four elements of the ancient world. You have earth, water, air, and fire. Uh, in Aristotle, there are five elements. The four elements we are familiar with are located on the surface of the earth and in the atmosphere. Then, when you get out here, everything is made of ether. It's made of, in Aristotle's system, ether. Now, that, that word itself has a long trajectory and a long complex history. The dividing line between the two, of course, is the orbit of the moon, the lunar sphere. Now, the planets, of course, are embedded in spheres, which are rotating in Aristotle's system uh, once a day. And, and you have uh, the, the stars embedded on the sphere uh, that is on the outside. And then outside of that, in Aristotle's system, you have the prime mover. What's important for our purposes is this central distinction here. Now, the moon, you know, will become a symbol of all that changes, of changeability. It's associated with the feminine in the earlier uh, sexist Western culture. Well, the reason for that is because everything in here moves erratically, imperfectly, disjointedly. It is the nature of matter above the lunar sphere to move in perfect circles at constant velocities, and so there's really a qualitative difference here between two different kinds of matter. This has a bearing on contemporary conversations about space exploration, even today. Because in the ancient world, if you were to talk about going to Mars, it would be like talk, me talking today about getting in a car and going to visit a dead relative. Okay? You can't get there from here. What for us is merely physical transportation for them would have meant going from one kind of matter into another. That was simply not thinkable for them. Now, this system that is in Aristotle is, of course, perpetuated. It is 
adopted by Christianity. It fits very neatly because to the Christians, the world we live in is a fallen world afflicted with sin. As we get closer out, we get closer to the presence of God and to heaven. For the Christians, of course, the prime mover then becomes the Empyrean, and this becomes the location in a spatial sense, and in a quasi-spatial sense, at least on the diagrams and on the maps of the time, this is where you find references to God, the angels, heaven, Empyrean, etc. We remember in uh, Milton's uh, Paradise Lost, Satan says, this imperial substance cannot fade. What he means is, as a former angel, my body is made of the Empyrean, and therefore it is indestructible. And so these, and, and Milton is a Puritan in England in the 17th century. He knew Galileo. He looked through Galileo's spyglass. And again, what you've got, there are real problems there with how much science uh, gets maintained in the minds of the poets. Okay, so this is one of many medieval diagrams. You're familiar with all of these. You have the four elements here. You have the sphere of the moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. You have the constellations printed here, usually references to the zodiacal constellations, and then Prima Mobile, uh, the prime mover, the, the habitat uh, of God. Another example, there are lots of these uh, in, in various languages of the Middle Ages, and, and they extend uh, quite a bit. Uh, this is not unique to Western culture. Uh, this is a Persian manuscript showing the soul of Muhammad uh, being escorted from earth uh, into the heavens with angels uh, on the sacred ram of uh, Burak. And there are other uh, factors which get added in the Middle Ages as well. This is a fresco by Pierre de Pucci. This is in Pisa, in the Campo Santo. Here you have the earth at the center. You have the spheres that we've already outlined. And here you have symbols of the constellations showing that this is the sphere of the fixed stars. Then what are all these? Well, we look really carefully at these and you'll notice that there are angels in them. There are spirits in them. And there is this notion that the virtues are associated with heavenly spheres that are, exist on the same kind of level that the planetary spheres exist on. And so you have an equation of Earth with fallen, erratic, etc. And the spheres of heaven with perfection of motion, of velocity, of momentum, but also with the cardinal virtues. And you recall in Dante's Divine Comedy, what they actually do is the angels come down from heaven and sit on the specific spheres to explain the meaning of those virtues to Dante as he rides up through uh, the universe. Of course, here you have God with his hands holding on to the universe. And this is a powerful image in the Middle Ages of a universe that obeys laws because they were created by a god of order. That becomes a powerful metaphor. This is an illustration from the Bible de Mocalise from Quen. It is in the uh, National Museum in Austria. And this shows God literally making the universe. Notice that the planets and the spheres, these are, this is like a lump of clay that was a lump of clay. It's not fixed and formed yet. But what he is doing is molding it in such a way that it will be ruled by law, by principle. And this is an important metaphor for the development of science in the West. We normally think of the Middle Ages as being anti-science and, and terribly uh, uh, repressive, as in many ways it was. Notice this instrument here. This is actually a stone mason's measuring instrument. This was used by the medieval master builder, uh, the construction foreman on the sides of the cathedrals. So this shows God actually in the process of making that universe, uh, bringing it into being. And so you have, as the Middle Ages continues, this notion that these spheres are not so much orbits in the modern sense, but they're arranged here hierarchically. You have again the moon, and you go on up through the symbols, and then you have God reigning over the top, and the sphere of the stars up here. So in a sense, you have an inversion topologically of the way the uh, spheres are arranged so that they more naturally fit into the medieval's natural inclination, which is hierarchy. And of course, um, in a sense, they get cruder and cruder, and in another sense, they become more charming. Uh, this is a problem solved medieval manuscript, again, heavy gold on the page, in which the sphere uh, is being turned by angels who are turning pranks. And again, angels are the intelligences, the divine intelligences. They are, in a sense, an aspect of divine love, as it's seen in the Middle Ages. But uh, for us, it looks rather, uh, rather odd. There was, of course, um, some uh, observational astronomy in the Middle Ages. Um, and yet, you will notice that 
uh, where summary treatment of the stars up here in rows uh, shows the level uh, of those observations for the most part. Now, you'll notice that all the pictures that I'm showing are in some sense portraits of the solar system. All of them have some kind of insight into man's relationship, mankind's relationship to the solar system in that particular historical period. This, of course, these are the Lindbergh brothers, the, uh, uh, the manuscript illustration for the Duke of Berry. Um, here you have uh, a human body with the constellation symbols, uh, and they are printed over the part of the body that that constellation was thought to affect or govern or control. And again, you have uh, a mingling of the astrological, the mystical, the superstitious with the scientific. And this is characteristic of the medieval vision. This, of course, is the greatest of the Gothic Cathedral, Chartres. And I want to show you just on the royal portals here. Um, you have standard symbols that you find, the Ascension of the Virgin, here's Christ, here's the four symbols of the Apostles. Over here, uh, going up and down, just as you have them in the fresco from Pierre de Pucci, these are the symbols of uh, the zodiacal constellations uh, printed over the cathedral. In addition, there's a zodiac window, uh, there's a sundial, and right over here, let's see, these are the constellations right over here. And if we look right over the doorway, right here above the capitals, on the right hand side, you find Aristotle and Pythagoras. And what this tells us is that in the medieval vision, the science, the history, the theology, it's all woven together in a very rich, rich, uh, poetically rich mixture. And again, back to uh, the Duke de Berry. This is the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. What's curious about this, of course, is that the perfection of Eden is shown as a circle. And again, you have this philosophical preference for perfect circles that runs from the ancient Greeks throughout medieval culture. This is why our, uh, Copernicus, in 1543 in the Revolution, wants to put the sun in the center so that we can get rid of those epicycles, those, those rather Jesuitical uh, fudge factors that allow us to describe irregular motions, but still thinking of them in terms of perfect circles. Here with the sun in the center, this is an attempt to go back to the classicism, the simplicity of the Greeks. Of course, it, it works only for a while, and it's superseded by Kepler and Tycho, etc. Uh, but this is the beginning, uh, essentially, of our world. Notice, however, how similar it looks to the Greek world uh, in terms of its structure. You still have what's going on outside the last, well, in Mobile, you know, right? It's still uh, a hard shell, in fact. And of course, that becomes enshrined, even with the discoveries of moons uh, and rings, uh, you still have this same kind of system. Now, it begins to break down here, where uh, you have text that admits that this sphere is actually infinite. That is to say, it simply goes, as Giordano Bruno said it would, that our sun is a star, that all the stars are suns, and then the possibility is that they all have planets and that they go on forever, and it becomes a very, very large universe indeed. This is taken up by the literary figures. This is the frontispiece illustration from Fontenelle's uh, Discourse on the Plurality of Worlds. Here you have the aristocratic tutor with his aristocratic student sitting in a garden. Up here you have a model of the solar system. The sun is in the center. You have Mercury, uh, the Earth with its moon, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, three of its moons, Saturn out here with its rings. Notice how blazing and glorious this is. It is a different world. The attitude towards that world is one of exuberance, one of expansion, one of possibilities. There's another side of this, however. This is a very famous painting by Joseph Rodney Darby from England in the 18th century. It's called The Philosopher Giving a Lecture Over the Orrery. Now, the orrery, of course, is a device, an educational device. Uh, it has gears underneath this table. It's a model of the solar system. You have a candle where the sun is. And it's wonderful for children. It allows you to explain what uh, day and night, uh, months, years, etc., all these things are. You can see how the shadows uh, are working on some of the planets there. Um, what I want to point out about this is how much we have lost since the very first painting that we looked at. Gone is that sense of lyricism. Gone is that sense of myth. Gone is that sense of, of living vitality. What you have here is a proclamation of victory 
in the aftermath of the triumph of Newtonian science. That we understand it now. The universe is a machine. Oh, how great. Now, what's the bad side of this? If the solar system is a machine, and we grow up on the Earth, and we're part of the solar system, then we are a sub-program. <coughs> gone is poetry, gone is lyricism, gone is prayer, gone is love. It's a very different kind of universe that they're living in, that they're taking for granted. Again, what is the, the whole message here is that the best metaphor for the universe is a clock, uh, a mechanism. Notice also the professor uh, with the hairdo, with the red sleeves. Notice how he's strategically positioned. The pyramidal relationship of this painting, he presides over it magisterially. He looks down and he says, this is my solar system. We own this it's, it, it's good and bad in lots of ways. And of course, you have a graduate student over here busily taking notes uh, at everything he says. Uh, in the 18th century in England, professors like this would actually travel to different aristocratic houses as an entertainment. They would give lectures uh, to, to small audiences like this. Because of this, because of the triumph of the mechanistic view of the solar system, when Halley's Comet appears over London, as it does here in this 18th century painting, they look up and they explain, oh, how agreeable, oh, how interesting, oh, how delightful. They're not threatened by it. Now, as you know, in earlier cultures all over the globe, the appearance of a comet means your king's going to die, the world is going to change, everything's going to be different, everything's going to be bad. And now, all of those things are absent. That's probably a plus, isn't it? You also have, at this time, ever since Leonardo wrote his famous letter to Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan, telling him about all the great weapons that he could design, you have an alliance between the creative intellect, the creative scientific intellect, and government. This, of course, is Louis XIV at the founding of the Academy of Sciences. Back here you can see uh, the Royal Observatory. Um, this is for many reasons, uh, having to do with time, uh, conquest, the military. In England, astronomy was motivated by the need for accurate timekeeping because of the ships that were sailing into the South Pacific on regular trade routes. And the, the triumph of that system, where government and astronomy and mathematics comes together, is what we think of as the history of the West. As we get to the 19th century, the generation that built the Eiffel Tower, the generation of Jules Verne, and the great inventions, science actually replaces God. It becomes the new goddess. It becomes uh, what will solve all of our problems. There's a great deal of misplaced faith in science, but one can hardly argue with the triumph uh, of the technique. Then we come to America, and we have an entirely new set of parameters. We have the explorer, we have the pioneers, we have the notion of moving westward, of divine mission. This is a painting by their staff, of course, this is uh, considered kitsch, mainly in our historical circles. Uh, but in terms of exploration, when I look at this painting, I see Mars. In a sense, this painting says all there is to say. There's migration, there's exploration, there's danger. Uh, we're not going to need hostile Indians shooting at us in space. The natural environment will be hostile enough. And we should recognize that a lot of people are going to die in this effort. It is going to be as costly, in a sense, as the move westward across America was. And, and in that sense, it is as serious a venture uh, as that earlier one. Well, we look at this and we can see a number of things. First of all, um, this is not a nature that is devoid of humanity. It is not a nature that is devoid of divinity. Now, the romantic reaction in the 19th century against the, the mechanistic world of the 18th century was one that said uh, nature does have something in it that is quasi-divine. Uh, going from Goethe to Wordsworth to Emerson and Thoreau in America, that sense motivates the contemporary environmental movement in, in many respects. I think it's underpinning. Well, this is a nature that uh, is beautiful, is, is glowing, and, and our going out into it is an enterprise that glows with a kind of divine purpose. Um, one could talk about the, the impact of this painting forever, uh, it seems to me. But there's another side. When we look back at the history of migration, uh, we also have quite an effect on war crimes, don't we? We have the indigenous populations of the New World, uh, we have genocide, we have oppression, we have, uh, uh, whether it's uh, the, the Native American or the species uh, of America, the buffalo, and so on, uh, we have a set, uh, frankly, of mistakes. And so 
part of charting out our future course over the next 500 years is to look at the last 500 years and not repeat the mistakes and to decide what it is we need to avoid. Now, very likely there is no life on Mars, very likely there is no, quote, indigenous population. However, there probably are on Mars things like the Grand Canyon or the Grand Tetons. When you get there, you look at them and you'll say, this is so beautiful, we don't want to spoil it. We're going we're to rope this off, this part of Mars, this part of the moon, and we're going to build our settlement somewhere else so that our children will be able to visit this thing and enjoy it. And so in that sense, I'm going to be proposing, in effect, national parks on the moon, on Mars, and on other environments, even environments which have no life, which have no ecology, no ecosystem to speak on. In a sense, our proper orientation has already been given to us by our own heritage here in America. If we go back and look, this is Thomas Cole, 1830s, the Oxbow. This is a beautiful vision of man living in harmony with nature. If we'll look out here, you'll notice it's, it's beautiful, it's expansive, this is not the entire painting. You look down here at this wonderful landscape and you see fields. You see that this has already been, in a sense, domesticated. That humans are already living there and working this land. It looks so glorious. And then out beyond the mountains, you see more richer possibilities on the frontier. Uh, this is from the 1830s. And this is what we want to avoid. This is Kimbrough's painting back in England during the Industrial Revolution. This is what started the Romantic movement, in a sense. It was a reaction against the excesses and the abuses of not only science, but its manifestation in the Industrial Revolution. And so you've got good and bad, what we want to have, and what we want to avoid. Again, we have answers already given to us. This is folk art from the 1830s. This is by Hicks. This is one of over 40 paintings he did called uh, The Blessed Kingdom. It's actually Quaker art from America. You'll notice lots of biblical references here with the lion and the kid and the child and so on. Uh, animals which uh, could compete are living together in peace. And over here, the Anglo uh, aggressor, as it were, from Europe, is sitting down with the indigenous population, uh, and they're working things out. They're, they're negotiating. Now, if we look at illustrations of space exploration, what do we find but the same thing? Here we have American explorers, the American flag, the hand of friendship, and the other, that is, the indigenous or the foreign population, is always considered as perhaps wiser, alluring, strange hieroglyphic symbols here, which uh, did a mystery and, and fascination. And of course, out here, you have other planets suggesting that the frontier continues and continues. It's a very wide universe indeed for us. If we look at such things as startling stories, I have a collection of, of images of science fiction, which I happen to love. But um, in a sense, uh, as an art historian, I'd say there are no trivial <coughs> images. Uh, one of the very important, I think, rituals of our civilization since the Renaissance is planting the flag. And you, you see it when it appears uh, in the Spanish explorers in Columbus. You see it in movies like 1492. You see it handled differently in different ways. It becomes a subject for iconographic treatment. It's saying, what is our real relationship to the land we're about to go to? It is an act of nationalism, of uh, perhaps religious uh, uh, incursion, uh, but also it's an act of sanctification. And, and here you have some astronauts out somewhere, uh, probably rendering thanks that they're alive, uh, but also in some sense, uh, what I would suggest is that this ritual, wherever it appears, now remember the Apollo astronauts on the moon, they land, they planted the flag, then they apologize and says, well, we come for all mankind, really. And so there's this sense of ambivalence in the modern period about what it is we're actually doing. And I think that's a good thing to have. What I would suggest is that this involves uh, bringing the gods, whoever they are, in on the act of space exploration and sanctifying our relationship with the land. In a sense, that's the price that we will pay when we go to Mars that will allow us to take possession of the land. In a sense, the land will then rule us as much as we rule the land. <clears throat> of course, the literature is full of, of uh, alluring and endearing treatments. This is from Collier's in 1908, during the Mars craze with Lowell and so on. In 
which creatures living inside the canals of Mars were presented as having large eyes and puppy-like and beautiful. Um, we, we tend to want to project imaginative images outward which show um, some kind of answer to our humanity in the cosmos so that we are affirmed uh, in one way or another. And what I want to suggest is that the classic painter of space painting, um, Cesar Bonestell, uh, we saw an earlier painting by him just a moment ago, uh, is actually working in that same vein. That the outer space landscapes that he portrays in his great art are also portraits of a solar system endowed with mystery, endowed with life, and re-endowed with a kind of lyricism or mysticism. Uh, down here, of course, you can see some characters involved in some sort of narrative struggle for survival or something in an old astounding magazine. Uh, I think this is a detail of the picture we just saw earlier. Um, Bonestell is painting these things in the 40s and 50s. He did uh, uh, backgrounds for paintings, uh, I'm sorry, backgrounds for movies like Forbidden Planet and so on. Uh, but, but essentially, he's the grandfather who gave birth to the uh, field of space painting in the present. Uh, which is uh, currently flourishing. A couple of examples, and then we're done. Uh, this is by William Hartman, uh, who is at, uh, associated with the Lunar Planetary Lab at the University of Arizona. Um, it's called Anticipation. Anticipation. Now, this is a portrait he did on the Cape during one of the NASA programs. You can see over here uh, a shuttle about to be launched. It's early morning. It is full of possibilities. And suggestions for the future. Uh, as it turns out, this happens to be the mission that carries the Galileo. And so, what anticipation means includes all of the data and all of the beautiful pictures and the knowledge brought back by the Galileo approach. Of course, in one sense, anticipation means we're waiting for the launch. In another sense, anticipation means we look out at the small landscape, what it is that we will become as a result of having moved into space and enlarge ourselves and become that larger presence in the solar system. Of course, we know where we're going and when. Uh, this is my first space conference. I am a humanities teacher, and so uh, I'm a little surprised by a lot of uh, the things that I see going on around me. Uh, I don't think we have to choose between Mars and the moon. Obviously, we're going to do both. We don't have to choose between man and unmanned. Obviously, we're going to do both, uh, etc. I think that the last July 4th was miraculous. Uh, I was one of those glued to the TV uh, and one of those millions of hits uh, on the website. Uh, I think that was uh, a real step forward uh, in terms of the general audience's apprehension of space exploration and, and what it all means. And I return to this idea of the sanctification of our bond with the landscape. We have a, a huge field today of nature writers in the West, of Native American writers who reminded us in many ways about the sacred connection of human community with the landscape. Uh, we do things with reverence, but we don't refrain from doing them. Uh, I would suggest that this is what we will build up with the Martian landscape uh, and, um, of course, the uh, Valles Marineris, uh, and with the lunar landscape. Uh, two very different environments. I tend towards uh, Zubrin's feeling that uh, Mars is the new world. Um, but I don't know. I'm just a humanities teacher. Uh, but I, clearly, uh, I think that we will inhabit uh, all of these areas uh, within time. And of course, as we move into the outer solar system, we have uh, ice. Uh, we have uh, perhaps uh, an ecosystem of water underneath the ice on Europa. We have lots of ice in the solar system. There is no reason not to be going out there. And uh, where does it all end? Well, we have the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud. Freeman Dyson and others have uh, excellent plans for human habitations that far out, uh, unthinkable as it is to us, and yet this is only the first step. We have taken responsibility for the globe, then we will take responsibility for the solar system. That's not the end of the story, but we're not very, uh, we're not knowledgeable enough to describe what will happen after that, but things will happen after that, too. Some other paintings in terms of suggestions. This is a Russian painting done in the mid-80s during the Cold War. Um, and it's called The Meeting. Here you have a cosmonaut uh, and a woman. Notice uh, she has a brown skin, perhaps suggesting indigenous populations in the outer reaches of the universe. Notice the tree and the sun, the 
Garden of Eden uh, suggestions that are implicit in this painting. And this meeting is one of love, it is one of uh, joining, uh, it's one of reverence. And so I think that uh, in the field of space painting, we can find rich poetic uh, metaphors, rich images which describe uh, the underpinnings of what it is that we're going to be doing. This is one of my favorites. This is called Life from a Far Star by Dubrovin, uh, also a Russian painter. And here you have uh, a naked child. We have a lot of naked child children in, in Russian space painting. They always represent young humanity. Um, notice the, the wonderful uh, golden skin tone over all of this. You have a path which is made of golden jewels. And it runs off. And here's the light from the star coming down. Uh, the, the highlights of the star and the jewels of the bracelet uh, commingle. And there's uh, ruin and burning going around in various parts of the painting. Uh, a great deal of danger of some sort. Up here, uh, what is both a 50s science fiction helmet and a halo around the head of the child. And of course, out here, the path is obscured, leading out into the universe. And of course, if we look carefully, right over here, see these little spikes on, on this other trail here? Well, these are children. Okay. So those are other civilizations that have made it past our current dangerous situation. What's dangerous about where we are now? Well, so many scientists seem to suggest that we're at a kind of choke point, that nuclear power, uh, mutually assured destruction, uh, the hazards of the environment, uh, that we have some perilous waters we have to navigate before we can, as it were, graduate and become true citizens of the galaxy. Well, that's what this painting is about. Other civilizations have done it, others have failed, uh, we're still in the balance, seems to be the suggestion. Of course, the Cold War is over, mutual destruction doesn't look very likely. However, I remind you that a limited nuclear exchange, perhaps Pakistan, India, China, Iran, Iraq, uh, would be just as damaging and, and set space exploration back 200 years uh, and could even cause a new religion against science because it was science that got us into this mess, that kind of thing. So we, have, we still have to be very careful. Finally then, my suggestion is that on many fronts we are making progress in recontextualizing our place in the solar system, in the popular arts, in the media, movies like Apollo 13 and Deep Impact, we are laying the groundwork for a real sea change. And it's not a change of philosophy or science or engineering or governmental policy. It's one of those greatest of all changes. And that is a change in the common, almost unexamined assumptions of everyone in America about what our role is in the solar system. Thank you very much.
examples can teach, I think, uh, louder than words. And a more specific question, what, what do you think about the paintings of Robert Paul? Oh, um, I actually, I live, I live in Tucson. He lives in, in Phoenix. And uh, I know his work, and I love it. I respect it very much. And uh, we have a mutual friend, but I still haven't met him. So, um, but I, I like his work a lot, all of that stuff. Uh, Ron Miller, Kim Ford, um, he's wonderful material. And again, no one in the art history world will, will talk about that. That's um, an interesting question. Why is it, for instance, just the bone cell in uh, art museums? Uh, well, it's, an, it's an, academic an, academic bias, think, an academic bias, I think, an academic cultural bias. And um, it can be violated from time to time, but it's, it's rather difficult. Um, I think it's because it lies in, in the realm of what they would consider popular art, uh, that it, it doesn't fit into the uh, streams of continuity that we normally define as modern art, um, Matisse, uh, Picasso, et cetera. It's genre you know, art in the same way that science fiction is genre research, precisely. Yeah. In the same way that science fiction has had a great deal of trouble getting accepted as literature, yes. even yeah. though there's some, you know, some of it is, is just pop boilers and some of it is really good literature. But all literature is largely trash. It, it's only a few things yes. that are really good. Same thing is true with science fiction. Yeah. The best of speculative fiction is my book. Classics are trash, too. Yeah. 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 I think that um, <laughs> there, there are two things going on here. One is that there's a ghettoization of genre literature and genre art. Uh, but there's a good side and a bad side to that. The bad side is that the, the great experts of art history don't write books about them, that they don't tend not to write dissertations on Bonus Stoke if you're doing art history in Yale, et cetera. Um, but uh, you all know Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, the author of the Mars Trilogy. He points out, and I agree with him, that um, that in a sense it's okay to have that ghettoization because the other people in science fiction know what you're doing, they know what you're talking about, and uh, it might be better off that way for a while. Uh, it, it is clear. As if this is a gestation period or something? Well, do we need the acceptance yeah. of the mainstream uh, to do what we're doing? Uh, when that acceptance comes, it will come with compromise, with um, with some things that won't be pretty. Um, it, there's a double life in academia today in which every professor reads science fiction and fantasy and no one will admit it or not. <laughs> and it's just, uh, it's just assumed. That's just the way it is. That's all right. I can live with that. And you have to do your publications on other things. Richard, I'm just curious to know if you're familiar with the work of Ken Wilber, the philosopher, um, in this philosophical framework in which he talks about these different trends ever, ever since the Enlightenment and the postmodern era and so on. Um, yeah. um, <coughs> I brushed past it once more. He has a, a, his framework's a wonderful tool to, again, contextualize these Can you write down the name of the title? I can't, yeah, yeah. I can imagine, yeah. Um, I just want to say it's really like you have somebody other than me running around. Don't be silly, I'm a horse going to you. Both men and I mean. <laughs> well, there's lots of people who think that. I think, yeah, you know, there's a lot of people that argue, but there's also a lot of people that understand that that's the way it has to be. Yeah, I've been arguing with people about this all week. That the tragedy of my life is that I remember watching Disney when I was eight years old, because I figured he said 20 years when I was 28, we get the woman who was when I was 21. The tragedy of my life is I just turned 50, I'm starting to realize I'm not probably going to go to the book. I know, yeah, I know. I'm the same way. We were, uh, my husband and I were really married in 1970. One of the things, that was just thought of. Three or four people married in the same day my wife and I were married. No, but that is my.
three hundred. Yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah. only yeah. because some years ago, the time I got like some wide. Okay. Right on the forefront. There have been many times in history when the universities were the last to get it. The Renaissance, the Eagle, and all, and Sorbonne, holding on to position. So there's no real objective measurement to say it's wrong. That's right. Yeah. Hey, that's okay. That's, it's We're clinging, clinging to the methodologies of an over here. Okay. okay. I have a really, really, really basic question that nobody's been able to answer for me yet. What is the meaning? <laughs> well, um, bureaucratically, you can define it as uh, English literature composition. German, Spanish, French, Italian, classics, Greek or Roman culture, including architecture, studying literature, etc. So in each of those it means language and literature, uh, reading novels, poetry, writing novels, and so on. Humanities includes all of that and art history and music. And and generally it tends to be broader and not as deep in practice. So what you're saying some history, some philosophy. I'm in a humanities program. So sort of an art history type related thing, but somewhat related to uh, to all those people. Hey, I'm a literature person. Yeah, uh, that's it exactly. I mean, basically, I don't like English departments. Well, that English department is different from English, right? Well, quite probably. But yeah, you have a substantive definition, and then you have a bureaucratic definition. Yeah. And, uh, in terms of what building. What, you know, if you take a humanities course, what can you expect to be doing? Yeah. You might listen to some opera, we'll read some poetry, we'll look at video, we might look at advertisements, we'll look at women's studies, we'll look at things. Today, it means a lot of things. So nothing that I haven't done in my life, except that I try to avoid opera. <laughs>